Books coverage of Miami Book Fair 2017 continues. What a pleasure it is to be sitting right now with E.B. Ozoy, who is, is E.B. Zoboy. Yep. So sorry. <laughs> who's the author of American Street, a National Book Award finalist this year. So cool to have you. Welcome. Thank you for having me. What a fun moment you're having right yep. now with your career. Lots of fun. <laughs> yeah, this is your first real book, though. You've been writing, as we said, for a long, long time. Yes, I have short debut. stories published. Yeah. I have a picture book, though, but this is my first novel. Yeah. Yeah. So cool that the, your first novel is greeted with a National Book Award finalist. Yep. Yeah. That was probably a very special night the other night, being in this sort of glamorous book world and being able to sort of go through that that awards process. What was it like for you as a as a debut novelist? I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, there were certain things I didn't think would happen. It's all the traveling, which I love, and I get to be in the community, on the ground. I'm doing lots of school visits, library visits, and I didn't know that was really a thing. Yeah. So it's just a, a bonus, an added bonus. Yeah. yeah. So this wonderful journey yeah, well it's let's it, the story felt a, a little bit like some of your own life i mean you infuse a little bit into it obviously it's not bit. totally um <laughs> but it's about a family that comes from Porto prince mm -hmm. the mother is actually detained mm -hmm. and is not able to come with your main character um in a way there's some similarities to your life and that you also came from Porto prince can you talk to me a little bit about your your youth and your upbringing and when you came to america yourself uh, so I came from Haiti with my mother, uh, just like my Fabiola in my book, uh, at the age of four. And when we left Haiti, we moved into a neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York, called Bushwick. Right. And at that time, Bushwick was described as resembling a war zone. And it was a really broken neighborhood, just like New York in general was just at its knees at the time. Um, it's not the New York that we know today. Not the Bushwick we know today. Right, so, definitely yeah. not. And which is why I uh, decided to set American Street in Detroit. Uh, Bushwick has undergone a lot of changes. Um, when I was a child, there were buildings that were burnt out, dilapidated buildings, uh, boarded up buildings and row houses. But we lived like in a nice part of the block. <laughs> and so, you know, and that kind of brokenness was on a block to block basis. But I had a, a great childhood inside the house. I wasn't allowed to go out. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, when immigrants, a lot of immigrants come to this country, they're not usually moving into uh, the suburbs or some of the wealthier or more stable communities. Uh, we're moving into broken communities and disenfranchised communities. Uh, now, while I didn't come here as a teenager, I came here as a child. And Fabiola came here at 16, and I pulled from my experience of being a child in New York City at the time when it's struggling with the violence and drug addiction and um, unemployment rates. And I decided to set it in uh, Detroit because Detroit is very much like new how New York used to be. And there was one particular article in the New York Times called Last Stop on the L Train, Detroit. Now the L Train doesn't go to Detroit, of course. The L Train runs through Bushwick, New York, um, Bushwick, Brooklyn. And the idea was that now that Bushwick has been fully gentrificated, um, the, it's not affordable anymore. So where are these artists and innovators and you know young people moving now? And they're going to Detroit. Yeah. And at the time, there were ads for Detroit in Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of just saying, hey, here's this new uh, uncharted territory. You know, here's the Wild West supposedly, and, and that's kind of not fair. But I started thinking about my own childhood and say, okay, what if there are, you know, an immigrant would move to Detroit at the time that it's still at its knees and it's still struggling. And there is a Haitian community in Detroit. There is a large immigrant population in Detroit There's in general. Yeah. yeah. And just imagining being a teenager moving in, moving from one country that's struggling, that is on its knees to moving to a city that's struggling. And, you know, and some of the parts are kind of like stretched out or exaggerated for story's sake. But what if you're met with violence coming here and you had all these American, these ideas of the American dream in your mind and you're met with such hostility, such violence, some coldness, um, you know, the sadness sometimes of not fulfilling whatever the American dream is. Yeah. And Fabiola, you mentioned when she comes to Detroit, she moves in with her while she's waiting for mm -hmm. her mother and she, mm -hmm. she's separated. She moves in with her cousins yep. uh, her from Detroit who are have been living in that neighborhood for their entire life. They know that town, that neighborhood. They know how to survive and live and thrive in that neighborhood to some degree. 
Um, Fabiola is completely intimidated by that at first, obviously. Can you talk about that sort of dropping her in the middle of this right. this um, uniquely American household right. and right. having her come, as you said, having been in a totally different culture before that. So, yeah, they're, so her cousins are first-generation ge- Haitian immigrants, and one of the cousins was actually born in Haiti but came here as a baby. So they're fully Americanized, but not in the, in the general sense. Right. They're Detroitized, if there's yeah. such a thing, or more specifically, west side of Detroit or that particular neighborhood. So they have assimilated. And that assimilation process is specific to their neighborhood and whatever it is that's happening in their neighborhood. Right. And they're, and as I say to the young people I meet with, they're kind of ratchet and hood, meaning they're they they're they're streetwise, mm. and they've had to do what they needed to do to survive as black girls in that particular city. And she's thrown right into that milieu, and she has to figure out whether she holds on to her Haitianness, which is. She's kind of docile and meek at the beginning. It's, it sounds like a younger character's voice. And what I tell young people sometimes in Haiti and a lot of other countries, in fact, when you're 16, you're kind of like 12. You know, when you're 12, you're kind of like nine. Yeah. And it's not in intelligence or book smarts. It's more in demeanor and how uh, young people respond to adults and to the world around them. So she's coming into this this city and into this family where the her 16-year-old cousins have taken on way more responsibility and have seen way more than she had ever expected. Yeah. Although she's seen some of the similar things. There's a scene in the book where her, she and her cousin are kind of one-upping each other on how much violence have you experienced. Yeah. Is it worse in Haiti? Is it worse in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere or one of the poorest cities in the country? Yeah, it's a fascinating scene. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's different, too, than what you described because you said when you came to America, you, you lived inside. You weren't allowed to be outside necessarily at the beginning. Right. And so your world revolved around an inside version of New York. Oh, I saw outside. I yeah, looked out course. the window yeah. often. Had I, and, and the thing is, it's not, I don't want to portray, like, the kids outside were so bad, which is what my mother's idea was. She thought I'd be, like, she'd be throwing me out into the, you know, to the wild. Um, there were kids outside, and they played very differently than what sh- how she had played in a Caribbean island. Right. So they were, you know, they were they run they ran the block, as I say to young people. And I, when I came outside, I remember there was one scene. The girls threatened to beat me up if we, if we see you outside yeah. on the side. We pulled from a real life experience. Up. Yeah. Yeah. And that was just a, I think they were hazing me or trying to see what I was made of. Yeah. Maybe they. Do you I remember how you responded? Of, I stayed inside. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm pulling from those experiences, even if, you know, if I was like seven or nine. Yeah. uh, That same idea for 16, 17 year olds Mm -hmm. where there is a new kid on the block. And because of the environment of the culture of that neighborhood, how do you respond to the new kid? You beat him up. Yeah, that's right. You You see what they're made of. You set them straight. Yeah. Well, you know, this is interesting, though, because you talked about those kids that have been Americanized, right? Right. so they're, they're first generation mm-hmm. uh, in, in that Detroit neighborhood that you write about in, right. in American Street. But the second generation is going to be completely different, and, they're gonna, and they don't remember necessarily the challenges of that transition that you oh, talked yeah. about for yeah. yourself, too. Right. Your kids are going through the same thing in real oh, life. Yeah. You have these two daughters and the son. Mm-hmm. They're, they're growing up here. Right. Do you, do you, what do you see between those generations? How quickly... Does that transition happen to the point where you almost don't even remember that that was part of your life anymore? Right. They're not having the same experiences yeah. at all. Have they been to Haiti, your, your own children? They have not. They have not. Uh, they're, my husband's Trinidadian, so they've been to the islands. Uh-huh. They've been to Trinidad and to see that. You know, they've felt what that sort of culture is. Mm-hmm. So How important is it for you to have them feel that or to know that that's where you came from? It's very important. Very important. That's part of their American identity. Uh, so I need them to be grounded in culture and history so that they're not always trying to reach back and find themselves in a way, which was my journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I need them to have that balance of being fully American in, in whatever way it means to them and fully sort of immigrant or have some sort of cultural identity that right. they, they can merge the two. Which is such an important part of Fabiola's story, your character right. as well. Right. Sort of maintaining 
her, her, her true identity while at the same time beginning that adjustment period into an entirely different world. Right, absolutely. Which your cousins kind of usher her into a little faster than maybe she's ready <laughs> yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an amazing moment that I read about mm -hmm. that this flash moment when you were discovering, because the street couldn't be per more perfect, right? right? American Street is at right. the corner. And I know Detroit, I was born and raised in that area mm -hmm. of the country, mm -hmm. but the corner of America, and I've never been to the corner of America and enjoy, but I do know it is a tough part of Detroit. Mm -hmm. I will say though, the joy in American, that intersection couldn't be more perfect from a literary standpoint. How did you discover mm -hmm. this perfect name for this novel? So I, I didn't know there was an American Street or Joy, uh, joy Road when you I knew, I knew there was a Joy Road. Detroit, though. You knew I knew, gonna, right, yeah. I knew there was a Joy Road. I didn't know there was an American Street. And it's, uh, and as my fellow writers were saying today, Google Maps are, are friends yeah. <laughs> for writing about specific scenes. Right. And just looking at the overview of like, okay, west side of Detroit has some larger population, but it's more like uh, Dearborn th down mm -hmm. on the southwest Detroit where there's a large Mexican-American population. And I'm just trying to see where can I set an immigrant family in the city of Detroit. Just over, I was like, hey, American Street? And just dri driving down American yeah. Street, I see Joy Road and I'm taking a look at the houses there, the types of houses, there's these tiny, um, what are they called, um, gunshot houses, yeah. or it, when you, the idea that you could like shoot from the front door and right. it'll Scary. go through the back. But, yes. <laughs> but meaning when they were first built, the idea was that they're so tiny that you could walk from the front door to the back door. And there are no uh, like driveways at all, no garages, they're, and they're so close together. Yeah. Who could have lived there? And I had to add a little bit of the history of that part of Detroit. And just finding the neighborhood, and the neighborhood and that, that corner, it, it's not just that corner. I had to dig deep and find the history of that corner, find who lived, who were the first inhabitants there. And I'm writing about violence, and I have to make it so that the violence doesn't start with the characters in the book. I'm going all the way back to bootlegging and prohibition with the Purple Gang, and the demographic is very different. Uh, I took it back to Henry Ford and the Chrysler and Ford uh, plants and all of that intertwined into this American story. You realize story. you know more about Detroit than, than most of the people who probably live there. I realized <laughs> that because I was, did some school visits yeah, yeah. and the you students know. were like, really? Huh? <laughs> so, but the idea though that that, that corner actually right. drove so much of the story in your mind and right. fed this idea that you're onto something. Right. Um, is a really interesting sort of pathway into the novel. Did right. you think that that was what was happening when it was happening? Did you understand that this was one of those ratchet moments that was going to get you to that next tier? Yeah, of it the was story? very serendipitous, and I've had lots of serendipitous moments there. And I use mythology. There is a figure who stands at the corner. Um, he's uh, he's called Papa Legba, and he represents crossroads and intersections and choices. And I had to put them there. And, and I'm like, this is perfect for in a corner of American Street and Joy. Yeah. And l on that corner, like there are the houses on both corners, but the opposite corners, one corner has a liquor store and the other corner is a ch small church. Interesting. <laughs> so this is the so perfect corner, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You, you talk about the myth myth uh, mythology, mm -hmm. um, but you, faith is really important to you too. And it's a big part of this book. And there's, it, there's elements of sort of religion in, in, in this book too. H how important was it in, in when you were writing the story, was that something that you kind of were tethered to as you were thinking about it? Right, I think it's less religion and more mythology. Um, I, with This is a Haitian story and I had to include Haitian vodou, which is not the Hollywood version of vodou. It's, it's a real uh, mythology with a pantheon just as vast and deep as Greek and Roman mythology. Mm -hmm. And I realized there isn't any, enough media that delves into that. There's all, way more yeah. media that bastardizes it. And in my story, Fabiola is a believer. And it's less religion, it's more tradition. So sh this is why in Haiti you can have Catholicism and practitioners of Vodou. And it just means that you see the spirits in other things. Mm -hmm. Um, and then go to church on Sunday yeah. and, um, you know, and worship or Jesus and the Catholic saints or what have you. So, and this is why there's synchronicity with the Catholic saints. So Papa Legba is also St. Lazarus in Catholicism. So that sort of syn synchronicity in Fabiola's tradition allowed her to see this homeless man on the corner as a Papa Legba figure, mm -hmm. because that's part of the tradition of seeing 
and energy in everything. So even her cousins represent uh, a spirit or a deity. Uh, so and that's what I mean in that sense, it's less religion and more worldview. Yeah, it's very beautiful. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's also an element of dropping this sort of worldview into um, Detroit yeah. where there mm -hmm. are other worldviews. It's a, it's a mishmash, as you said earlier, right. of cultures. There's a Muslim population. And in fact, right. Fabiola uh, mm -hmm. has a sort of romantic feelings mm -hmm. right. for a Muslim right. character in the book, too. And right. those two things kind of crashing together also make up a big, big part of the book. Right, right. I had to um, include, I knew the, just that's part of digging into Detroit history as mm -hmm. well. I knew that the Nation of Islam has like a huge population in Detroit and they were first started there. Uh, so all of these elements I'm putting in, I know there's a huge trans community in Detroit and there's a scene there and it's honoring, trying to honor every facet of the city and she yeah. comes face to face with sort of everything Detroit and everything American. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a beautiful story. It, it Thank fills you. A, a void that I don't think was there. This is a, is a really unique book in a lot of ways. When you were coming up and reading, w were there always books that you wanted to read or did, or did you feel like that you were kind of writing that book that you didn't have when you were younger when you were writing this book? Uh, yeah, I, was, I felt like I was writing the book that I didn't have and or it's a mismatch of books that I had already loved and read. Uh, read. So yeah, just taking elements from my favorite books over the years. What were a couple of those favorite books, do you remember? So I, I wasn't much of a reader as a child, uh, simply because of the, my family dynamics and this access to books. I lived, uh, you know, in a the community. We didn't have bookstores, and the library was a treat. So, but I was not without stories. So I grew up with a lot of oral tradition. But right. I did not start loving books until later on in high school and discovering some of my favorite authors. And um, do I name one or several? I know it's hard to do. Right, no, right. you can just tell, like, what were the kind of writing, what, what kind of books that first, when you first started diving in, that really grabbed you? When I started diving in, um, the first book that I really loved language it was Ntozake Shange's um, For Colored Girls Who Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Was Enough. I discovered Edwidge Danty Cat's Creek Clock as well. And I discovered Octavia Butler's Wild Seed and Parable of the Talons as a high schooler. Wow, you then found in the some college. really yes. great books. Right, right. You weren't messing around when you jumped in, yeah. finally. Yeah. <laughs> in some of the best of our generation, right. for sure. And yeah. then Weege is here, in fact, at the yeah, Miami Book Fair. Hopefully you've met her. her before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Another amazing contribution from the Haitian culture yes. and to Caribbean literature in general. So. Absolutely. Well, what a wonderful thing, E.B. Zoboy, to have you here. And I'm so proud of all that you've accomplished. I'm excited for you, and I want to see the next thing that you do. And I'm so glad that you're now part of our collective consciousness in the, in the literary world, too. Congratulations Thank on your you National so much. Book Award Thank honor. Thank you. And thanks for being here, too. Thank you for having me. All right, folks. E.B. Zoboy, the book is American Street. Pick it up. I'm Rich File. You're watching PBS Books coverage of the Miami Book Fair 2017, and there's more to come. Stick around. Stick around. Stick around. Stick around.